can stay right where you are and you can put love into your work and bring holiness into that work. And that really is the message, uh, the Catholic message of both Vatican II and Opus Dei. My favorite teaching of St. Rosemary, the universal call to holiness, that somehow my, my job is to find holiness and to bring holiness into ordinary circumstances like, like this one. There was a man who was born in a small town in Spain at the turn of the last century in 1902. He was the adored child of a devout Catholic family, a loving, spiritual family that suffered the death of three children and the loss of both their financial and social standing in their community. Despite these hardships, the family of Jose Maria Escrivá remained close to each other and close to God. One hundred years later, on October 6, 2002, that man was canonized by Pope John Paul II. His life and teachings had become an inspiration to hundreds of thousands of people around the world. People who aspire to live the message of Saint Jose Maria. People who believe as he did that sanctity, loving and carrying out God's will, is possible for ordinary people. As a young priest, Father Jose Maria Escrivá felt a deep yearning to do more, to be more. He prayed constantly, striving to understand what God was asking of him. One day, after years of thought and prayer, he saw what God wanted him to do to proclaim that all people can become saints while living ordinary lives in the world, and that what God asks of each of us is to do just that. Later, he would name the institution he founded to spread this message, Opus Dei, the work of God. His view of Opus Dei was always very much that it's just a little piece of the church. It's the Catholic Church lived in a special way, but really basically just the church. Jose Maria Escrivá was a quiet, humble man who had enormous charisma. He was a man of prayer and reflection who spent his life connecting in a profound way with each person he met. And he was always fully present. What I can tell you about Saint Jose Maria was that he was a father. He really was a father. and. Uh, a father with a, with a motherly heart. If St. Jose Maria were here in this room, <laughs> what would he think? Um, I think he would be excited that, that there are people in the work that live and breathe corporate America and don't want to leave it to pursue a life of holiness. Ampersand selected equals comma six. Within Christianity, there are those who view the pursuit of wealth as sort of an evil. And so you have to be dirt poor and you have to shun technology. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have people who um, equate business success with a sort of holiness, if you will. It's, it's sort of the prosperity, uh, you know, um, Christianity. Well, God blesses me because I won this business deal, you know. I think that God, for the most part, uh, stays out of our business. He gives us human talents, and he gives us, at times, uh, inspiration and insights. But he expects us to work for what we get, and it requires, you know, sacrifice. There's whole books of the Old Testament that lay down in great detail what can be offered to God and what can't. And he says, I want the lamb that's one year old, male, without blemish. I don't want the mangy goat. <laughs> it's nested in this grid. If we're going to say to God, this is the manifestation of my love for you, well, we don't want it to be a mangy goat. <laughs> we want it to be something as good as we can make it. I gotta play well. I've known I can't offer it up. I try to win. 
so it goes about your intention. It's just the intention, right? It's yeah. God's a little bit more merciful than the world. The world judges you only by results, and God kind of judges you by effort. It takes tremendous courage and God's grace to follow Catholic orthodoxy. The culture of life is one that embraces life at all stages. One that rejoices over the birth of a baby and doesn't roll its eyes over the nth baby because n minus one was the ideal number. <laughs> a culture of life is one who loves a person who is aging beyond their normal productive human capacity. Five fabulous kids. I have a hard time keeping up, probably hear that quite a bit, but they are so full of life and they give so much joy back. They're beyond any expectation that we can have. I was a crash firefighter. It was stateside here in the high desert, George Air Force Base. Then I went to Korea, that's where I met my wife. We've been married 18 years now, I have four children. Uh, then after that, uh, I came onto the LA City Fire Department. The cantaloupe, tomatoes, everything just needs to be chopped. I would say the work is kind of my work. I mean, how I fit in to the big scheme of things. And primarily, it's just the ordinary things done well. I have what they call a plan of life. Just like any athlete, they exercise, they eat right, they listen to a coach. Well, uh, I start the day off with the first stop, turning to God. I make a morning offering. After reading the life of Monsignor Scrivá and learning of, his, of what he had to say about prayer, it's very simple, I think. It's just find quiet time uh, to speak with our Lord. I say the rosary daily. Aspirations, which are basically just invocations to God, almost like a dart sent. We gotta go. We gotta run. Like going into fire, sometimes you're there's a lot happening, and just Lord, give me the competence and the strength to carry out my duties. And let's let everything work out fine. Really giving all of my attention to the task at hand. That have been taught as prayer as well. Just seeing the firemen go by down the street when I was a little kid kind of like just drew me. And the camaraderie with the guys here, the friendships that you uh, make with them. And then working as a team, that's a big thing. If everything goes well by the end of this year, I should be promoted to captain. So I'm looking forward to that. I've spent uh, five years in the US Air Force as a firefighter, and then uh, 17 years now with the city of Los Angeles. So I'm ready to supervise firefighters. You want to just leave the tray? Seeing this, Maria would talk about the idea that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you're there for a reason. You know, God put you there for a reason. And you get to find out what that is. I was very nervous about how my own convictions about my faith, my morals, were going to interact with the craziness of Berkeley. You know, I was like, okay, I want to meet people, I want to make new friends, but how do I, how do I make it clear to them that I want to live this way, or that I have these certain beliefs? You know, they're gonna think I'm crazy. Problems and whatever, academic, moral. And then slowly, you know, with people I would meet, with the different girls in my dorm, what I've come to realize is that I just want to, when I'm talking to somebody, I just want to say. This is what I believe, and not make any apologies for it. You know, and I found that that's attractive to people. You've just had a very difficult tragedy in your family life. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened. Um, almost exactly a year ago, my mother passed away um, at the age of 49. So, the ripe old age of 49. I remember still getting the call. I was sitting at a Starbucks, up actually just over the hill, studying for finals. And, you know, hearing that she was in the hospital, it was, it was, a, it was a blow. Within a month and a half, she was gone. And that was, it was tough. It was a tough, 
week, it was a tough month, it was a tough year. I was very angry at God. I thought, you know, how could he need her more than we do? Like, what was God thinking? Was he on vacation that day? You know, I got to a point where I wasn't praying. And I just remember sitting in my car one day, just crying, you know. And I had my little Palm Pilot, so it was, it was sort of modern day crying, because I was taking, I was kind of journaling. I was thinking like, what, what is wrong? What's, you know, why aren't, why aren't things working out? Even just sort of within me. And I thought, there's something, there's something missing. And then it kind of dawned on me, I was like, oh, this is what it's like to starve your soul, you know, when you don't pray. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, it's a lot more clear to me now. I remember kind of sitting down and being like, I can't, I can't do all this myself. I'd like to think that I can, but, but I can't, and I need your help. So I just have to give these things to you. And I think that, that actually took a, that took a big load off to say like, it's not, it's not all my responsibility. You know, I'm gonna do what I can do and then say, okay, you have to take the rest of that. <laughs> oh, this smells so good. Doesn't that smell good? If you can and a lot of times with Santa Maria, I think the, oh, that call to holiness, oh, that universal call to holiness. And I also read that as the universal call to happiness. She's the executive chef. You know, like, that through this route, if you want to live a certain way, you will be the most happy that you can be. Bless the Lord in these thy gifts which you are about to receive from the body through Christ our Lord. Amen. It's a little bit of both a, a heart grab and a head grab. This was the first time in my life someone had told me that I am called to, uh, to, to be a saint. And, uh, and the way that I do that is through my ordinary work that God has called me to do here in the middle of the world without becoming a priest or joining a monastery or anything. This is what I am supposed to be doing to become a saint. Nobody had ever told me that before. And that profoundly affected me. My wife and I had always wanted to live in the country and have some acreage where our kids could run around and raise some of our own food. Got to the point in my professional work where it didn't really matter where I lived. I tell you, I don't think being a husband or being a father comes naturally to most men. I think it's a, it's a very difficult thing. And I'll say very honestly, like a lot of men, I am not naturally a kid person. But the teachings of St. Jose Maria have helped me see that fatherhood and being a husband is, is my vocation. It's where God wants me to be, and it's the way God wants me to live my life. So I'm not the best husband that I can be yet, but I'm... No, I never <laughs> And she'd be the first to say it. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the imperfections of Chris. Yes. What's the number one imperfection? <laughs> the camera's still rolling. I, I, th I think it's, it's, it's really... Um, it's selfishness with my own time. Wanting to have my own time and my own place where I can go and be by myself. St. Jose Maria says somewhere, you know, God is a great stone cutter. He uses a chisel like he's making a statue. And he sees the perfect image underneath the block of granite. For a lot of us, marriage and family life and the challenges of it are the hammer and the chisel that God uses to shape us into the more generous and more attentive and more loving as a people that he wants us to be.
tell my kids all the time that it's not my job to make them happy. It's not their job to make me happy. And things can't make us happy. And money can't make us happy. And people can't make us happy. The only thing that can make us happy is loving and obeying God. St. Jose Maria was instrumental in my coming to understand that. I always wanted to marry somebody who was really committed to God Examination of conscience. and knew his faith well and could really be the spiritual leader of the family. But I'm in the presence of God. I mean, I'm no wallflower. I'm no kind of shrinking violet, you know. I'm a lawyer. I have opinions and express them willingly all the time. But I wanted to marry somebody who was strong in the faith and committed to marriage till death do us part. He's not in it for the long haul. He's in it for the forever haul. Usually I, I round up the kids, move the sheep from one area to another so they can go get some fresh grass. Go open up the buildings, let the chickens out. <laughs> See, St. Jose Maria has told us we need to be a contemplative in the middle of the street, which can be pretty tricky sometimes, you know, if you're in a, literally in a street. In a farm, it's much easier. The agricultural parables from the Bible are all around you. A couple summers ago, we had a sheep went down with an injury. The vet wrote her off and said, you know, if, if you want to try, you can, but don't expect her to, to make it. But um, we took that as the gauntlet being thrown down. And uh, I was out here nursing her, literally, uh, you know, at, uh, back to health. And, uh, and she made it. She's, she's out there with the other sheep now. And you really you understand about leaving the 99 and going to tend to the one that really needs the help. And you know, I, I could go on like that for, you know, for hours about the different ways that, you know, things on the farm remind you of, um, you know, the spiritual life and, and really help uh, feed one's prayer. I started learning to cook about five years ago. The gardening has just been the last three years, and the canning has been the last two years. I'm kind of a work in progress. I get almost no moments alone. <laughs> Some people knit for that, some people jog for that, I garden for that. And sometimes I pray and sometimes I just think. Sometimes I don't think, I just work. Hey, guys! <laughs> don't hurt Mr. Jason. Hey, buddy. This fellow, he's my best friend. We were on the bench press and, and he was spotting me and he was leaned over and he had this scapular. I said, what's that? And, and he'd seen me at, at church before at St. Bernadette's and, and he said, you don't know about our Blessed Mother and the scapular? And, you know, I said, no. And he was kind of a jerk about it and was telling me, well, you need to learn about, you know, and this guy was like, and we almost got into an argument right there in, in this gym. It took him a year to get me to go to this Opus Day evening recollection. Afterwards, we went, I went out with a, a guy, he was in med school at the time. This was in the 90s and healthcare was the, the big, you know, we got to cut healthcare costs. And I said, aren't you concerned, you know, about not making as much money, you know, as a physician? You know, and he just looked at me and says, no, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it to take care of children. And, you know, at that point in my life, I just went, make a lot of money. But this message of, of, of having a deeper meaning with our work and being a married husband or a good salesman or, or a doctor to take care of other people. That was the message. It was, it was so simple and it wasn't intellectual. It was, I could see these guys trying to live it. Yeah, just, that's from just not like even that. Catholic, that's go, the truth. I mean, we're happiest when we're taking care of other people because we're not thinking about ourselves. That makes sense. How did you and Wendy meet? I was her sales trainer when I got out of college, the first year after I got out of college. And like I tell people, it's the best sales job I've ever done. And so th that's how we met, and then we got married a year later. And she converted on my birthday, we were at Mass, because she would go to Mass with me every Sunday. And she leaned over to me and said, well, I'm going to become Catholic. Happy birthday. I kind of gave it to him as a birthday present. So thinking I was doing kind of him a favor, but really it was kind of God drawing me in. That's also when Vince met. 
Opus Dei for the first time. And uh, over the next course of a few years, I started seeing him have a lot of changes and becoming this kind of manly man of prayer, I like to jokingly call him. And, um, but he just became a great, great spouse. I'd just come home from, I don't know, doing whatever, you know, grocery shopping, and there'd be a beautiful vase of flowers. And it's not my birthday. It's not, it's not, you know, an anniversary. And the card would, you know, just be something sweet. You know, Wendy, thanks for being my wife. What'd you do good today? I well, my play with David good today. We had Nicholas, our first son, who was born in 97. Aren't they me? And then David, who was a little bit of a struggle, too. We had a long hospital stay with him, but he got here safe and sound in 98. They'll try to bite your finger. And in 2000, uh, in August, we had James, our first son, who had a genetic disorder that was fatal. And so he lived for six days. It still, <laughs> still brings tears to my eyes to think about him. It was very, very hard to live through, humanly speaking. But as a Catholic and wanting to be Christ-like, I had to unite my suffering with Jesus' suffering, which he did for me, for everyone. James brought us great joys, great, our greatest joys and our greatest sorrows. Um, but he also taught us what to love was. You know, you lose a child, then you realize what life is. Life is such a gift. Oh, and there's baby Johnny. He's the next baby in this baby book. Johnny. And then, of course, Johnny was born in 2001. He is so handsome, isn't he? And then um, <laughs> about eight weeks ago on uh, May, let's see, let's see, what was the date? May 2nd, oh. we had William Phillip, who also had the same genetic disorder as, jo as um, James did. And he lived for four days. William was a huge part of our family. The ties that bind my parents and my brothers. William had a purpose. As a, as a mother, oh, I'll probably cry. Um, I still do a lot. Uh, but you know, you always want your child to hold. Um, but there again, I have to use those moments of tears for something good. Why didn't you stop? Why? If we stopped after, after James, we wouldn't have John. And if we stopped after Johnny, we wouldn't have William. So it's, it's, the, it's the incarnation of our love. I really connect with the spirit of holiness in the world, where you are, in your state of life. I'm married, I've run businesses, I've been in corporate, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son, I'm a brother. You know, what, what does holiness even mean? It's this um, being in the world, right where I am, being natural in who I am, building an interior life, meaning a personal uh, closeness to God, and letting that and the situations of life dictate how I relate to others. <laughs> I never thought I'd have five kids coming on six kids. I've always loved kids, but I, as far as my own, in my own life, that was not like a vision that I had, but I, I do, you know, without sounding too syrupy. I mean, when Naomi was born, it was a life changer. I mean, it just, from the moment I saw her, it changed my life. And with Leah, Rachel, Therese, Colette, they just continue to, to really, you know, bless me and bless, bless our life. A full cup or a half cup? A half cup, please. Okay. The girls love ritual. I think all kids do. So they want to know when things happen, when's my turn? And we set up early on with the older girls Saturday morning breakfasts. They set it up, and we make the batter, and now, you know, make the pancakes, and one plate goes upstairs, one plate goes downstairs. So it's like the whole ritual that's, that's grown out of that. But that time is really, it's, it's special for them and for me. <laughs> I 
I loved being part of a big family. It was always somebody around to play with. There was always something to do. Um, it was it was great fun. Dust runs the I path. hope you know to be able to give that to my children also. Hug. It's just the Melanie effect. When she comes into the room, she's so natural. She's just Melanie, you know. She's just there, and people get this sense when they talk to her that she's present. What does it mean to be present? In the moment, being in the moment. Deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. Deal with now, now, and not lose that moment. Get down to the moment. He says, life, as you really look at it, is the moment. Future is in God's hands. Past is in God's divine mercy. Now we have the moment. Doing the work of God is the lived expression of St. Jose Maria's teachings. For the people we have visited here, and the uncounted number of others throughout the world who strive to be joyful, to spread joy, and to keep joy in their hearts, the teachings of this man, this saint, will forever enlarge our vision to encompass ordinary people who aspire to live a holy life. Were you there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was there. We, you know, we got the, they sent me a VIP pass because I'm the relic. They put me over there on the, on the left hand side. We were all in our suits and everything. And I was saying to myself, Holy Christmas. Here I am. You know, this guy and I had pizza together. And uh, I told that kids at school, I'm the only guy that had pizza with a saint, you know. And so, and I see him there and, uh, and I'm saying to myself, my Lord, you know, just how God can work. Huh? He just took this little guy. Great. <laughs>